So I think we all want to use PARP inhibitors in non-BRCA mutated patients. The problem is we have no evidence that in the frontline setting, in patients that respond, that there's activity. So we stand before uh, the, the threshold of three trials that are going to inform that. So Chris, tell me a little bit about uh, VELIA. Uh, this study that we call GOG3005 and, and why that study is important. That study is important um, for several reasons. One is it's going to introduce us hopefully to a new PARP inhibitor mm -hmm. that we don't have a label right. for, uh, Viliparib, and it'll show us whether combining chemotherapy with PARP inhibitor in the frontline setting is going to be tolerable and efficacious. And so that's a very important trial that we hope to report, have report on this year. So that's interesting. We heretofore have not really been able to add PARP inhibitors to chemotherapy, but there's a phase one study that informed this phase three. Tell us about that dose finding of Viliparib in chemotherapy study. Exactly. So actually, Deb Armstrong uh, is presenting that at ASCO this year. Um, that really evaluates the dose that's uh, acceptable, um, and that's 150 milligrams. So uh, interestingly, uh, maintaining efficacy and uh, the ability to add uh, Viliparib at 150 uh, to chemotherapy uh, gives us an option that we don't have with any other part. Yeah, it's exciting. So that's one strategy with chemotherapy, and it also has an all-comer and a HRD sort of endpoint. Tom, tell me about Prima. Well, Prima is important because the primary endpoint is going to be the HRD population. And so, to your point, where we are with Solo 1, it's only in those with BRCA mutation, either germline or somatic. And this will greatly expand that, and we'll also get a look at, at uh, everybody. Um, so, very much like Nova, well, it'll be interesting to see what the data is, and if it's similar, um, arguably, uh, we could have an approval uh, for all patients. Wouldn't that be great? And it's Neraparib, which some people argue is the best PARP trapper, the highest volume of distribution, best, uh, that's controversial. Um, well, th those, those things are not controversial. It's the question, I, I think those are true. I think the question is how does that translate into exactly. clinical in, Into, into yeah. frontline PARP yeah. usage in a BRCA-like molecular signature, HRD, or an, an all-comer. Right. So, Michael, you want to combine both of them, right? That would be your style. You're a medical oncologist. You want to combine BEV and PARP. I mean, if, if, if PARP is so good and BEV is so good, why don't we combine both of them in the frontline setting? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question. So first of all, it solves the dilemma we have now, which is everybody's <laughs> arguing about BEV versus PARP, and if it turns out the combination is better, that solves that. Uh, and as you know, there are trials addressing this, yeah, right? So Paola 1 yep. does that, takes the Bevacizumab GOG218, and in the maintenance phase adds a lab rib. So we've got three studies. And I think they'll all be at ESMO. The Velia trial that you talked about, the Prima trial that you talked about with Neraparib, and then the Olaparib Bevacizumab. So I talked about what happened in 2018, IP chemotherapy, Bevacizumab, and Olaparib in mutated patients. We're going to have a conversation soon about what happened in 2019 with the addition of Viliparib to chemotherapy, the HRD Neraparib endpoint, and Olaparib Bevacizumab. I mean, we can barely keep up. How great is that? And we might add to that, at this ASCO, although it's in a recurrent setting, Avanova combines them also, which is interesting. So, so let's talk about that. So uh, uh, tell us about Avanova. Go ahead. So it's, a, again, it, it's based on this concept that the combination would be more effective than uh, single agent uh, PARP inhibitors. And there is biology behind that. If you make a tumor hypoxic, it does create sort of a pseudo-HRD phenomenon. So that's the, what drives it. It's in a platinum-sensitive recurrent uh, scenario uh, area in the natural history. Uh, it's accrued, it's not a huge study, it's about 90 patients, 49, 45 on each arm. Uh, and there's a significant prolongation of PFS on the combination. The question is, is that additive? Right. Or, or is synergy. that synergistic? But it's pretty big, right? I mean, yeah. it was 5.5 uh, versus 11.9 months, and I think the hazard ratio was 0 0.35, so it's a significant. Uh, so the reason I want to discuss that is that adds anticipation to pale the one and it also shows that maybe Tom we don't need chemotherapy frontline well that's the the interesting thing about uh, that particular abstract to me or even is, it's in recurrence know, to, right. to do this chemo free and, and to get results that are that impressive I mean right. even the single arm did as well as chemo and right. then uh, the doublet really outperformed and, and the, the beauty traditional chemotherapeutics uh, yeah of PARP 
uh, VEGF. It can also be olaparib sidirinib. It can be with bevacizumab. And it looks like it performs just as well as chemotherapy, so a chemotherapy-free regimen. And, and we give a lot of paclitaxel. And we talk every day we're in clinic about alopecia and neuropathy and aller, aller, hypersensitivity, right? So, and so GY004 will give us a little more insights on the platinum-sensitive group yeah. and looking at the combination. Yeah. yeah, very interesting. So Jubilee, we haven't really begun to talk about um, IO. Um, I think we've all come to the realization that ovarian cancer is a very cold tumor. The uh, mutational burden is low. Uh, the tumor infiltrating lymphocytes are there, but they're probably immunosuppressed. pd one expression is also inconsistent. Tell us about these frontline trials, though, that are trying to add IO to either PARP or BEV or all three. Yeah, so I think um, there are three trials that are ongoing now. Um, and they all actually are, are answering different sort of tweaks, actually. So the Athena trial um, is a very interesting forearm trial that looks at uh, platinum-sensitive patients who have... Uh, who frontline. Get, frontline, mm -hmm. who get uh, placebo or nivolumab or, as maintenance or rucaparib as maintenance or both. So I think that will answer the first question of can we use uh, either a PARP or immuno, or both, in like maintenance that. therapy. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one interesting, um, one interesting trial, certainly. And then when we look at the first uh, trial, you know, the, the first trial um, has an interesting control arm because it's the only one that doesn't uh, mandate BEV. But BEV allows it. But allows it, right. So we'll have an interesting control arm uh, to look at. And then we'll, um, we'll be able to, uh, to evaluate both a... Um, uh, a PARP inhibitor as well as uh, uh, immunotherapy uh, together uh, in that situation. So is that going to be financially toxic? Think of it. Bev, niraparib, and dostarlamab? Yeah. Theoretically. And maybe, and I, or just, just flat out toxic. So we'll see. That's, that's great. <laughs> that's great for. Theoretically. With the dollar sign, right? Four dollar sign? Four euro. Four, or euro. And um, then similarly, you know, we have the Javelin uh, 100 PARP trial as well. Mm -hmm. And that follows a similar theme, uh, but I think there are a couple of interesting tweaks to that. So bevacizumab is in the control arm for all of those, um, but we have a... And, and I can just announce, it's in the public domain, that that trial has been closed, is that, is that Pfizer has decided not to pursue Avelumab any further. And uh, it's, hard, it's hard to keep these. We, have, we, we struggle keeping them straight. You're doing a great job, by the way. I don't know if you have this written down in your notes. Yeah. Probably not. You're so smart. But, um, and then the, the, the uh, uh, DOO and OV43, which is a lab rib with or without Dervalimab or Pembro. So it, it, it becomes exhausting to, to figure out what the right combination is. And it's a very competitive landscape that all of the makers of, not all, Certainly all the PARP inhibitor manufacturers are adding IO, and like you said, maybe with BEV. So it'll be interesting to see those results and see if that refines how we, right. how we give this therapy. And then isn't there Imagine 50, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Tell us about that study. So Imagine 50 is looking at adding an anti-PDL1 inhibitor, tezolizumab, to basically a GOG218 skeleton. So that's going to um, be interesting, uh, uh, an interesting readout, whereas we can then use Frontline BEV with possibly anti pdl one So, so Jubilee, you're, it's it's hard to, to 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 be as good as you, but I'm going to try it. So, I got BEV IO, imagine 50. I got BEV PARP Paola. I got BEV PARP IO in OV43, DOO, and first, and then pure maintenance in Athena. I mean, if I have trouble. I know, right? Well, she's, she tutors me. But that's, so that's, I don't, I don't, I don't really want to get too much into the details other than to say that we got three, we have three categories of agents, anti-VEGF, which is all BEV, three PARP inhibitors, maybe soon to be four, Viliprib, and then we have these checkpoint inhibitors, uh, Dervalimab, Pembrolizumab, uh, Atezolizumab, and Dostarlimab, four checkpoint inhibitors. And, and all of the permutations are in play. And even the regulatory components may actually utilize cross 
trial comparisons, right? So, I mean, for instance, if Prima is positive and everybody's eligible for a PARP inhibitor, will uh, AstraZeneca take the yeah, right. data from Paola on the control arm and say, hey, we, like they did with study 19. But, right? the, but the thing that has not happened is if there's one indication for a PARP inhibitor, that, that the insurance yeah, company yeah. says, well, that's okay, we'll pay for whatever yeah, part, it's yeah. not a plug and play. That's right. Plug and pay. <laughs> that's a good one, right?